Melissa, please feel free to start. Melissa, would you like to begin? Can you hear me? I'm not sure if she can hear me. Okay. Melissa? Okay, I hear you now. Perfect. <laughs> it like cut out all of a sudden, yes. And Yes, we're ready if you'd like to start this session. Thank you. Yes, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. Um, this session is really in recognition and in celebration of Black History Month, which is one of the heritage months that is recognized in the United States and um, past few decades as well in some other countries have their own months uh, dedicated to celebrating a variety of histories and heritages. For today's session, I'm going to kick it off with a little bit of an introduction, some welcoming remarks. I will then turn it over to Marwa, who will give you a little bit of an overview about Education USA. And then we will turn it over to our guest speakers who will have much more to share about the educational experience at an HBCU, which you will learn more about as well. So a brief introduction about myself. My name is Melissa Deschamps, and as Marwa mentioned, I'm the Regional Educational Advising Coordinator, also known as REAC for short, for Education USA, overseeing the Education USA centers in the majority of the Middle East and North Africa countries. So you'll learn a little bit more about what Education USA is, what we do, what we're about, and how we're here to help anyone at any stage of their educational journey in learning more about study opportunities in the US. But first, before we get into that, I just wanted to briefly talk about what Black History Month is and what we, why we celebrate Black history. In the United States, um, as I mentioned, this is a month that is celebrated in February, but again, as I, I had referred to, other countries do have different months where they might also recognize this. And Black History Month really is about celebrating and recognizing the contributions and accomplishments of Black Americans, which you'll also hear the terms African Americans or those who identify as part of the African diaspora. But as with any identity label, um, some would prefer Black over African American. And so again, it's just a preference issue. But officially, um, with the complex history of injustices and racial inequalities in the US, this month really highlights those things um, that should be and typically are in some circles celebrated all day, every day, any day throughout the year. But by giving February this specific month, the focus of Black history, we are able to draw attention on the importance of acknowledging that Black history and Black culture are very much American history and American culture. So as we continue to grow and learn as a society about inclusivity, about reckoning with our difficult past and confronting some of those harsh realities that still exist, we push ourselves to do better and change for the better. And those things can be done when we learn and we think back on where we have come from. So education, experiencing differences and reflecting and learning about our own perspectives and how those relate to our environment and those we are interacting with. These can all lead to helping us um, create more understanding among and between people and that will also lead to more just societies. And so again, with education really being at the center of that and pushing yourselves outside of your comfort zones, those are all the types of things we're striving to accomplish. And so um, with that, I also wanna just thank you all for your interest really in having this discussion, learning more. And I look forward to hearing about the experiences of Rulan and um, the Stillman College experience. 
So I will turn it back over to Marwa. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa, for this uh, introduction and welcome to everyone who joined us today. Let me briefly talk to you about Education USA and our services, just in case uh, you uh, are joining us for the first time. So Education USA is a US department um, of state network. There are over three, 430 advising centers in 175 countries and territories around the world. And our mission is to help students um, who are interested in pursuing their studies in the United States, whether it is for a short uh, degree term or for a long degree term, uh, we are here uh, to help you. And um, as you can see from these pictures, our services um, differ. For example, we have have center group information sessions, um, we have special topic sessions, and of course we have one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultations. And we always have uh, pre-departure orientation sessions for students who um, will travel to the United States to begin their studies. Uh, we visit different um, high schools, we visit different universities and colleges in our country, um, youth centers, and we work closely uh, with our colleagues at the American uh, Spaces. Um, uh, whenever we can. We also participate in different, you know, college fairs uh, and national educational and cultural events. We also welcome uh, U.S. university representatives who visit the country and we help them facilitate their sessions and meet students just like you who are interested to learn more about the U.S. higher education system, the application process, and the institutions. And of course, we have our virtual sessions and webinars. Um, and uh, just like today's session, we usually announce about these sessions, you know, on our different uh, social media platforms and our social and our official uh, website. The five steps to a study is your guide, uh, whether you want to pursue, you know, your undergraduate degree, your graduate degree, or, um, for example, a short term degree program. Uh, the first step is to research your options. It is very important for you to learn about uh, the institutions um, in the US because there are over 4,000 US higher education institutions. And so they will offer different things. And you need to choose the best fit universities and colleges, you know, based on your uh, goals and your needs and your future um, uh, goals. Uh, finance your studies is the second uh, step. Uh, you need to understand the expenses and the cost of living and studying uh, in the US. Uh, and also you need to learn about the different um, uh, scholarship opportunities and finance financial aid opportunities available to you at different uh, US institutions. Uh, the third step is to complete uh, your application. Uh, of course, there are different uh, requirements that you need to um, uh, prepare yourself for and submit as part of your application. And that will depend on the uh, degree program that you want to pursue and apply to um, in the US. The fourth step is to apply for your student visa. After you um, get uh, uh, an admission offer from a certain university and you accept their offer, you need to get your visa so you can actually travel to the United States. The fifth and final step is to prepare for your departure. We also help you in terms of preparing yourself to travel to the United um, States. And you can find so much information and in details uh, on the Education USA website, which you can see on the screen, educationusa.state.gov. Here you can also see our website and social media channels. Um, we have a Facebook page, Instagram account, a YouTube channel, Twitter, and you can also contact us on, on our email, ramalla at educationusa.org. If you are not from uh, our country or if you do not live in the West Bank, you can find the nearest Education USA Advising Center uh, on the Education USA website. We have an exciting event that is open for all uh, students and parents and counselors uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. And this event is the virtual university fair. We have over 60 US higher education institution representatives who will join us for this amazing, uh, amazing uh, fair. And you will have the opportunity to watch different uh, recordings and interact with these representatives and learn more about uh, their institutions. Uh, 
the virtual fair uh, will be on Thursday, 17th of March, and the time will be between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern time, which is 5 to 9 p.m. Jerusalem local time. We will share with you the registration link once it is ready. Again, follow us on our social media platforms and check our website so you can see the registration link and join us uh, for this session. And now um, with our guest speakers, we have um, Mrs. Andrea Wagner. She is the Senior Enrollment Management and Admissions Marketing Coordinator at Stillman College. And we also have with us Roland Abu Nahla. Uh, she is a third year student at Stillman College and she will share her experience as an international student currently studying at Stillman uh, College. Um, if you have any questions during the session, uh, please feel free to enter them in the chat box and we will have time to answer your questions at the end. And now I will turn it over to Mrs. Andrea. Can you please unmute yourself? Okay, sorry. You would think I would be Zoom savvy after Zooming for about the last two years excessively, but sometimes technical difficulties happen. Yes. So good morning and good afternoon to those of you that are in Jerusalem or other time zones other than myself. Um, I bring you greetings from Stillman College, but before I get into my role at Stillman College and the history of Stillman College and how Stillman College has played a pivotal role in Black history and are preparing the next batch of leaders of color. So they're also working in what I like to say Black future. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Andrea Dobines Wagner. I was born in Washington, D.C. on Malcolm X's birthday, which um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Malcolm X. Some would consider him a martyr. Some would consider him a hero. I consider him a birthday twin and a combination of the both. Um, I got my bachelor's from the University of Alabama, which is not an HBCU. Um, in, Tuc in Tuscaloosa, where Stillman happens to be in communication studies and political science. And my master's is actually in African-American studies. So Black history is, honestly, I'd argue Black history is my first love. I was diagnosed um, at five years old with a rare degenerative eye disease called retinal pigmentosa which technically means I have permanent tunnel vision. And to help, so these glasses you see are not decoration, which technically means that I have permanent, like permanent tunnel vision. Um, so I see what is in, for, in front of me quite perfectly. It's like, imagine, imagine looking through a paper towel roll. That's essentially my peripheral is non-existent. So with that said, I did not have the normal, a normal upbringing. I am also blessed to say that I am a third generation educator. All four of my grandparents, my mom's parents and my dad's parents were educators their entire lives. And about the time I was three years old, they retired. Well, my dad's dad, my paternal grandfather was a history teacher before bec later becoming a principal. So he instilled in me the love I have for Black history. I remember reading about Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and Harriet Tubman thinking, wow, these people are amazing and they look like me, which was complete contrast from my Washington DC classrooms at a predominantly white private school. I would only hear about Shakespeare and John Adams and George Washington and Betsy Ross, and none of them look like me. So from that point on, I literally wanted to learn everything and all I could about Black history, which led me to when I enrolled in undergrad, which I hope many of you are or decide to do when the time is right, I wanted to take every African-American studies class I could to the point where I took so many of these classes that it was suggested that I major in African-American studies, but I was already way too close to graduate to add extra classes. So I decided to get a master's in it, which I think is what led me here. So 
why Stillman College? Stillman College is a historically black college or university that was founded in 1876. To me, because there are 107, well, 106 other historically black colleges and universities spread out throughout the United States, the state that has the most historically black colleges or universities is actually Alabama. Surprise, surprise for many. I'm currently in California for work. And so it's technically 5.20 a.m. here, but California has doesn't have any. So like I'm spreading the word about historically black colleges and universities to you all on this Zoom call this morning. I'm doing the same thing in a couple of hours here in California. But Stillman, unlike the 106 other historically black colleges and universities, was founded in 1876, which was extremely pivotal because technically, I guess tech, from a textbook standpoint, the Civil War ended in 187, 1865. So 11 years later, Dr. Charles Allen Stillman, who what we would call today as an ally, was a white minister, he wanted to start a school to train African-American, which they couldn't were considered Negroes at the time, to train them to preach. So just men to preach. That's how Stillman started, only 10, 11 years after the Civil War. So think about it. This is during Reconstruction. What is Reconstruction, you may ask? Reconstruction was kind of the blurred line between slavery and present-day America. There were still rules and laws in place designed to keep the power in the hands of the minor, ma majority, which at the time and still is, white people or Caucasian Americans. Um, and so what also is absolutely remarkable about Stillman College is do, right, creating the college or a university, or even sometimes a class is not free. It takes a lot of money. Well, there was this family named the birthrights. The birthrights were previously enslaved people who never even stayed in Alabama, never even stayed in Tuscaloosa, where Stillman is. And they wanted to help um, fund Dr. Charles Allen Stillman's vision. And so they paid for the start of Stillman. They funded Stillman. So Stillman now has Birthright Alumni Hall, which is the gymnasium, and is named in their honor because without the birthrights, Stillman wouldn't even be in existence. Now, let's um, fast forward to, I'm not going to say present day because I still wasn't born yet. Let's fast forward to 1960. In the United States of America, the Civil Rights Movement technically is still going on. We're unfortunately fighting for some of the same rights, like voting rights and proper education rights and proper access to housing and financing and pay equity, which are the same thing that my now deceased grandfather was fighting for. But in the 1960s, it was pretty much open season on human rights. And so America was still extremely divided as if the same way they were during slavery. Well, Stillman, Stillman students were very active in ensuring that Tuscaloosa residents, which included Stillman students, had equal access to the courthouses in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So at the Tuscaloosa County Courthouse in the 1960s, there were still divisive and separate water fountains and restrooms. But Black people were still summoned to the courthouse, still worked at the courthouse, still utilized the courthouse, but could not use the restroom or gain access to water fountains. And so the, in true fashion, the people wanted to do something about it. Well, they decided to march from Stillman to the courthouse. And unfortunately, police and state troopers were involved and beat and even killed some of the people that were protesting. They threw, and so the people went into a church to try to seek refuge because you think that no, no one is gonna bother a church. Unfortunately, that's not true. 
they threw bombs and tear gas inside the church. The church is known as First African Baptist Church, which was, of course, a church for African and or Black people who decided to worship there. And they probably even had a few white parishioners because, again, think about it. Every person, non-person of color is not a threat. Some of them actually are allies. And you can see them throughout history. And even in present day um, historical times, you can see that there are allies that still exist. Um, I was going to make a joke that might not be appropriate, so I'm going to skip past that. But allies are very important. So um, what did Steelman do? Steelman protested every single day. So students from Steelman, some, some professors from Steelman, some people that worked at Steelman, to ensure that equal access to those water fountains came about as they should. And this day was now known as Bloody Tuesday, which was June 9th, 1967, I think. I'm sorry, my other device that I'm supposed to be reading these notes from will not come on. So this was in June in the 1960s. Well, what happens next? So Bloody Tuesday, they finally have access to the courthouse. They finally have access to the restrooms. They finally have access to, you know, basic human rights. So they think until it comes down to getting people to register to vote, trying to elect black, elite, black leaders in Tuscaloosa for the first time. What did Steelman do? Steelman had an alumnus by the name of Bryant Melton, who was still alive, who ran for a state office to represent the state in Washington, D.C. to help bring better everything to Alabama. He was a, Steelman, a graduate of Stillman College and Stillman students and Stillman professors again went out and campaigned to ensure that Bryant Melton be elected and he actually was. So Stillman, now let's fast forward to some present day. Since the since well before the death of George Floyd, or I'll go as back 10 years ago. On Saturday, this past Saturday, it had been 10 years since Trayvon Benjamin Martin was killed by George Zimmerman for just having the wrong colored skin. While George Zimmerman never saw a day in jail behind murdering Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin's story is not a uh, monolith. Unfortunately, there have been so many other Trayvons, even this year. In 2022, there have been Black people killed by the police or by vigilantes who felt threatened by the pigment of their skin. Well, ever since then, Steelman students and faculty have been active in grassroots organizing. What is grassroots organizing, you may ask? It's getting people registered to vote, getting people clean water, getting people access to health care when COVID was extremely high in numbers, getting people access to testing, getting people access to the doctors, getting people, some people even access, there have been access issues to getting the immunizations and the booster shot because they aren't evenly distributed across the communities, which is unfortunate, but environmental racism or um, environmental injustice is real. And you can see that playing out in waterways. So having access to healthy water, that is a basic human right. Everyone, regardless of what color your skin is or isn't for that matter, deserves clean drinking water. And so Stillman has been a part of that. They've been marching, they've protested in local protests. So in Tuscaloosa, state protests. So in the state of Alabama, Alabama always has education day at the Capitol. The Capitol of Alabama is in Montgomery. But fun fact, the Capitol of Alabama was also in Tuscaloosa before. And it was in Selma, Alabama before, but now it's in Montgomery and has been in Montgomery for well over a hundred years at this point. But Steelman students participate in education day at the Capitol where they go demand equal access to what their counterparts did. Like I told you earlier, I attended the University of Alabama and um, it's not an HBCU. 
is not a private institution. So they receive way more funding than Stillman and unfortunately way more support than the historically black colleges in Alabama. So they look, they look different. They, they're, they're bigger, they have more access to resources. So they typically attract more students, but that does not mean it's better by any means. Um, while I did not attend an HBCU formally, well, I did for a year. I attended Southern University Law Center, which is a HBCU in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to pursue a JD or a Juris Doctorate because I have dreams of being an attorney and fighting for civil rights for the rest of my life. But Stillman does something that I've seen no school do, and that is empower people of color, like this scholar that is on this call, getting ready to talk to you about her experience. But it's been an amazing thing seeing Black professors um, and other professors of color leading in research from mathematics to biology. I, don't tip, I didn't see that on such a wide scale at the University of Alabama. Of course, I did have a couple of Black professors, especially in my master's program, because I was studying Black people but I didn't see people of color every single day who were real life examples of what I could do one day, which ties right back into the absolute reason why I love black history and why I think it is imperative to study the just history period, but especially history of people that were considered once considered property um, or just casualties during war, which it looks like the world is going to go into any minute now, unfortunately. But if you don't know, your, the there's a very dangerous thing about not knowing history because history tends to repeat itself. Um, I've been watching a lot of international news coverage. I'm pretty sure some of you have done so as well regarding Ukraine and Russia. And Every anchor, regardless if I'm watching Fox News or ABC or CNN or headline news, has referred to what is going on now that is, they've never seen anything like this in the past 60 plus years. Well, I'm only 30, so I don't know what they saw prior to me arriving here on earth. However, I do know that history definitely repeats itself. Um, before Trayvon Martin, there was Jim Lee Jackson. Before Jimmy Lee Jackson, there was Emmett Till. All of these black men were murdered essentially because of their skin. So can I get you all to do me a favor? And well, can I get one volunteer? Anyone, because because we're in Zoom, you all can't repeat after me at once. It'll be chaotic. No volunteers. Well, since I cannot get any volunteers, I'll just say this. Black history is everyone's history. Black history is everyone's history. The stories of strength, of triumph, of overcoming is essential to your survival, even if you don't identify as Black. It'll remind you on a personal level that while the society may say I can't do something, history says I can't. Ruby Bridges, think about this. I don't care how old you are or what you have or what you don't have or what education you acquire or if you have an accent or, it, <coughs> or anything like that, you are capable of greatness. Every single one of you on this call, regardless of what society may say, regardless of what even your family may say, you are capable of greatness. Ruby Bridges was six years old six when she made international news for integrating William Fonts Elementary School in New Orleans, Louisiana. Ruby Bridges 
is still alive, which means that this wasn't that long ago. While I wasn't born when this happened, I've seen schools go from integrated, which means, of course, there are everyone could attend regardless of their race to back basically being segregated all over again because now um because I'm not even going to say because of the last president but racism has the fountain of youth unfortunately which is why it's so important that you learn all you can not just in February not just the 28 days that are designated to the study of black history or the uplifting of black history or the uplifting of contributions that black people have made. But every day, if you would run out of days before you'd run out of contributions black people have made to society. And so I'm going to end with this poem which will require me to go off of the screen because like I said earlier, my other device will not open regarding a place called the Black Belt. What is the Black Belt, you may ask? Well, the Black Belt is a region in the United States that got its name from the soil because it had a very dark hue or dark in color. Well, now the Black Belt, which is um, counties in Alabama, counties in Tennessee, counties in Mississippi make up the Black Belt. But now the Black Belt is could be considered the black belt um, because of population. And so if you ever pay attention to American politics and they talk about what is a red state or a blue state, um, that means if the state is Republican, it's red. If the state is typically a democratic state, it's blue. Well, Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi are historically red states but they have what we call blue counties and their blue counties are typically in the black belt. So the title of this poem is Beauty in the Black Belt. I wasn't born, nor do I currently reside in the black belt. But if you ask me how I felt, I tell you that it is home for me. I owe the 334 for who I've grown to be. So this morning or this afternoon, I pray these words speak light into dark places. I pray these words bring joy to black and brown faces and all of the other races that could use a dose of hope. Since I am a teacher, let me school you. I'm not here to fool you. I come to bring the real. So join me if you will. Sit back, relax, and let's take some trips. If you listen, you'll catch this truth dripping from my lips. Did you know that there are 18 out of 67 counties that make up the black belt. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, once upon a time, these same counties got their name from a rare soil that could make anything grow. Now the name is linked to population. So they talk about the black belt bad. They say we're all poor, uneducated, stagnant, complacent, Loud, loud mouth, violent criminals, drug dealers, users, government assistance abusers. They dog our communities. They down our schools. They say nothing good comes out of the black belt, but I'm not a fool. They clearly don't know me. They definitely don't know you. The black belt is home of legends, so I'll just name a few. Three of the most prominent leaders in African-American history, period, could have picked a bride from anywhere in the world, but Andrew Jackson Young, former U.S. Congressman, U.S. Ambassador, and former mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, had to have him a Marian girl by the name of Jean Childs. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. also picked a Perry County queen because he knew no one could do it better than Coretta. Ralph Abernathy, the second president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, came from Linden, Alabama, and wanted to make sure his wife held it down. He married Juanita Jones from Uniontown. A.G. Gadsden, who in the 1930s dabbled in everything from hotels to funeral homes, insurance agencies, and banking, was born not far from here in Demopolis, Alabama. The jazz legend 
Nat King Cole came from Montgomery. Rosa Parks, who is often the only Black woman commonly found in history books, was born in Tuskegee, the same town responsible for producing Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, which is another HBCU, the Tuskegee Airmen, and Lionel Richie. Selma birthed Reverend Frederick Douglass Reese, who at age 88 was still a beast. Now, when it comes to legends in the Black Belt, I could go on all day. The royal may look down on us, but there is power in these towns. You can do all the things America says you cannot achieve if you just believe. Where there is a will, there is a way. There is beauty in the Black Belt, regardless of what they say. Some of the bad talk about the Black Belt comes from us. Some of it comes from racism. Some of it comes from hate. But I stand before you today to remind you that if you can survive in the Black Belt, you are destined to be great. Thank you. And while, while I know that poem talked about a specific region in the United States, I'm going to expand that to Jerusalem and to wherever you all may be from. Like I said, it does not matter. You are still capable of making history. You are still capable of achieving your dreams. And I want you to remember that from January 1st to December 31st and every day in between, not just in February. Your life matters. Your future matters. Your vision matters and you matter. And in true respect to my position, if you are interested in attending Stillman College, Stillman has a home for you, founded on the strength and souls of Black people that were formerly slaves, that weren't even considered people, that were considered property. And 145 years later, we're still producing excellence. And you can be a part of that. We have 17 majors to choose from currently and are ever growing. Five of them can be done completely online. If you have a, and Rowan, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, can speak more to this from a student standpoint, but if you have at minimum a 2.5 grade point average, you're eligible for a scholarship. Our scholarships can range up to $14,000, which will cover your complete tuition and fees. And if you are interested in applying, apply. There is no application fee. There is no ACT or SAT required. And another great thing about that is our scholarships are still open. They close on April the 1st. Um, and I would encourage you, if you are even just considering it a little bit, I'd encourage you to apply early because once that money is gone, the money is gone. But never, ever doubt yourself. Never doubt your dreams. And if you ever need a reminder, just do your own research. They're trying to erase Black history every day. So I may not even have a job one day being able to do this because I actually teach Black history. But um, unfortunately, I couldn't tell you all I wanted to tell you in such a short period of time, but I would be interested if they'd have me to continue the conversation for any of you that are interested. But Black history is my history. Black history is your history. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Wagner, for the history and the poems and the stories that um, you have shared. And we would definitely be interested in having future sessions also to discuss um, this topic. Um, and now we will have a chance to um, listen to Rulan, uh, and she will share her experience, you know, as an international a student who is currently studying at Stillman College. Again, I just want to remind the participants, if you have any questions, please uh, write them in the chat box. And Mrs. Andrea and Rulan will um, share, will answer them at the end of the session. Rulan? Um, thank you, Marla. Um, so good morning or good evening, everyone. Um, I am here to share my journey as an international student at Stillman College. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I am Rulan Abu Nahla. I am a third year business administration major at Stillman College with concentration in accounting and cybersecurity. I am the highest ranking sophomore for the year of 2021 
Stellan College, and I am one of the 86 students named as 2021 HBCU White House Scholar around the U.S. Awesome. Um, so I will talk briefly about my journey with MED. So um, I started as an Access Micro Scholarship student in 2016. Um, Access helped me to get introduced to the American culture and American history and also improve my English language skills. Um, then I joined the Youth Exchange and Study Program. So I did spend 10 months in the U.S. with a host family. So that was a great experience to actually um, um, to practice my English with native people and actually live what is it like to be in the United States. Um, next, I was admitted into the Health Fund Scholarship. Um, and the Health Fund Scholarship, uh, the Health Fund Scholarship helped me to prepare for um, admission for colleges and universities in the US. And after this very long process, I get admit, admitted into Stillman College, which at that time I didn't know that it was an HBCU, and I didn't even know what an HBCU stands for. Um, next slide, please. Um, so after the research I did on historically Black universities, uh, colleges and universities, um, I learned that they were established prior to 1964. Um, which principal mission was and still is the education of Black Americans. Um, so that was prior to the uh, people of color um, gaining the rights of education. Um, HBCUs offer all students, regardless of race, um, an opportunity to develop their skills and talents. Um, HBCUs train young people who go on to uh, who go on to serve domestically and internationally in the professions um, as entrepreneurs and in the public and private sectors. Um, after I learned all of this about history for black colleges and universities, um, I still wanted to actually live what is it like to be at an HBCU. Um, I felt like I need to actually go there to discover that by myself. Um, so next. Uh, so what is it like to attend an HBCU from my experience? Um, it was it is a very rich experience because of the diverse and inclusive community of students that celebrate um, the richness of the entire American experience because there are people from different backgrounds coming together. You don't only find black people at HBCUs, you also can find um, brown people and also white people. Um, uh, being at an HBCU helped me to learn about the black diaspora. Um, because students also develop a global perspective by analyzing how groups are interconnected, um, conventional beliefs are analyzed and challenged in classrooms. Um, being an H at an HBCU means that you are, be you are a part of a supportive campus environment. Um, minority students at an HBCU have increased level of engagement um, and greater involvement uh, with faculty and staff. Um, being at an HBCU means that you are more than a number um, because Stillman College is a small college. Um, administrators, faculty, and staff members can remember to even students' names, majors, and interests. Um, you don't have to introduce yourself twice. You matter. Um, they all know you and know who you are. Um, and sometimes you'll be surprised that someone knows your name, but you didn't even tell them your name. Um, you're uh, they, recognizing your worth. Administrators and faculty members value your accomplishments. They don't only care about academics, but also the psychological well-being of students. Um, I got COVID a month ago, and I was contacted by almost all my professors asking about how I was, how I was feeling. Uh, so they really care about you um, and not what you are. Um, being at an HBCU will help you um, jumpstart your career. Um, because of the great uh, unique opportunities that you can participate in, um, whether in competitions, um, researches, from lecture courses or internships to enhance your career and grow your um, academic and personal achievement. Um, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, here are just some pictures. Um, yeah. 
Um, so being an HBCU has given me the chance to be an HBCU White House scholar, um, which is a very great achievement that I can uh, to have on the resume. Um, so in 2021, I was selected to be one of 80 students around the U.S. to be part of the White House initiative on educational equity, excellence, and economic development through historically black colleges and universities. Um, I was nominated by my school president and uh, dean of School of Business. Um, so the HBCU um, Scholar Recognition Program helps to form the next generation of leaders who exhibit and champion the HBCU excellence. Um, the initiative selects HBCU scholars for their academic achievements, civic and campus engagement, entrepreneurial um, ethos. Um, as an HBCU White House scholar, I serve as an ambassador of the initiative and my college. Um, I also share educational and career opportunities with my fellow students um, through connections we make during the program. Um, next slide, please. Um, I am also currently a member of Alpha Kappa Mu Society. Um, this society aims to promote and reward academic excellence among HBCU uh, students. Um, being a part of the community means that I am one of approximately 92,000 members affiliated with 79 different chapters. Next slide. Um, uh, that, was, that was during our induction. Um, I am also part of Stillman's uh, on-campus organization. I am currently the chief financial officer of the poll an on-campus organization that aims to improve student engagement by bridging the gap between um, students and administration through different activities and conversations. Um, uh, I am also the treasurer of Mingo, uh, Phi Mingo, um, an organization that aims to bring people together from different backgrounds and cultures to show that to showcase the diversity of the student body and ensure that every Stillmanite has a chance to represent his or her identity. Next slide. Um, I join many programs and internships. Um, these opportunities, I don't think I would be able to get if I was not at, um, um, if I wasn't at an HBCU. Uh, the first one was HBCU and LA internship. Um, during this uh, internship, I got introduced to career aspiration. Um, so my voice is not clear. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, but if you can speak a little bit louder, maybe. Um, okay. Um, so I am a student at NHBC. Uh, I, I got... Um, I got the opportunity to be at an HBCU LA internship. Um, so I got introduced to, uh, to career aspirations in the media, entertainment, and technology industry. I also participated in speaker series and industry events to enhance knowledge of how the Hollywood industry works. Um, then I also got the opportunity to participate in the Coca-Cola Pay It Forward internship. Um, I gained experience in a wide range of roles with Coca-Cola, um, including sales, production, marketing, pricing, event planning, packaging, and community relations. Um, next, I also participated in the sales sessions uh, by JBL program and JLL Ambition Fellowship program. Um, they were both mentorship programs that helped me a lot to learn more about um, professional and academic um, development. Next slide, please. Um, I am also part of the Heart Honors Program. Um, it's a Stillman College program that provides opportunities for outstanding students to participate in rigorous um, educational experiences that will prepare a new generation of leaders uh, with traditional uh, underpinnings, um, a commitment to excellence, and vision to lead. Uh, this picture was taken at the Fox Theater during an educational 
trip uh, to Atlanta and we're going to South Carolina next month for another um, educational um, and cultural trip. Next slide, please. Um, I am also the ambassador of College of Distinction. Um, so being an ambassador for College of Distinction means that I represented Stoneman College and I also wrote a published piece about my experience um, as an international student at Stillman College. Um, next slide. Um, finally, I am the par a participant of the upcoming 2022 Battle of the Brains competition. Um, the fifth annual HBCU Battle of the Brains competition will pit teams of students from HBCUs around the country to determine which school is the, HB uh, is the HBCU Battle of the Brains champion in Texas that will happen in um, March the 9th. Um, so being at uh, Stelman College has helped me very much to gain um, exposure, uh, to be exposed to different experiences and different uh, opportunities that I don't think I would have been able to get if I was not at Stelman and at, 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 at HBCU. Um, Thank you uh, so much, Roland, for sharing your experience. Uh, it is always um, great, you know, to hear from uh, students who are currently studying at U.S. universities and colleges uh, and learning uh, from them about the different opportunities that international students can take advantage of, whether on campus or off campus. Uh, you have great achievements, so congratulations uh, to you, Roland. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the chat box, and for First, we can start with um, the question from Tala, uh, how studying in Stillman College is different experience than any other um, college? Um, I didn't go to any other schools other than Stillman College, but I think that um, it's an eye-opening and uh, being at, at an HBCU will teach you how to deal with different people who come from different backgrounds. Um, also, it, it opened many opportunities for me uh, personally um, to actually gain more exposure about different things in life. Um, I also like how it is a small college. Um, so like everyone knows each other. Um, I don't like being in like bigger schools and universities where you rarely know like people around you. Um, so I think it's a great experience for me personally. Thank you, uh, Rulan. Mrs. Wagner, would you like to add anything? Um, no, I think that answer was perfect and I can't speak to being an international student, so how dare I try to do so. Um, but I'm actually headed, like I told you, I'm in California. I'm actually headed to a, a another engagement, but I'm, I'm still here listening. Okay, no worries, thank you. Um, so we have another question uh, for Roland. Maybe you can give us some recommendations or tips to students who are currently working on their application folder. What can they do so they can have a strong application? When did you start maybe uh -huh. preparing yourself for the different application requirements? Um, I think I started on, in August, like we, we start early with the Hobson Scholarship. I advise them to actually uh, apply for the Hobson Scholarship because that will help them so much in the process of um, applying to colleges and universities. Um, I think um, the test scores matter, but also their experience and what they have done in life also matters, uh, community service work. Um, also, how much they show interest in what they are applying for also matters. Thank you, Rulan. And we always you know, recommend our students to begin the process early so they can have more time to prepare themselves and have more competitive um, application. Uh, maybe this question, Melissa, maybe you can give us some uh, feedback you know, or an answer. You know, What are some ways that Black history should extend maybe beyond the month of February? Uh, yes, yeah, so again, it's, 
not just compartmentalizing it, that's the only time to be thinking about these subjects and these issues, but any other time that if you're doing, I mean, especially as a student, if you're doing a project or recognizing you know, famous historical figures who have made contributions to anything, you know, whether it's a famous inventor or a scientist, there are some very key repetitive um, figures that keep coming up. And so dig a little bit deeper and identify somebody new, learn a little bit more about some of those other um, contributions that are not always talked about. And so you know, attending lectures and talks, um, watching films, reading books, looking at documentaries. Those are all different types of things that doesn't have to just happen um, during February, which is when you'll hear a lot more about it. But if you put a little bit more effort outside of this month, you will see that these types of opportunities exist um, all throughout the year. Thank you uh, so much, Melissa. Um, our time is already 4 p.m., so um, we can end today's session. Again, I would like to thank um, our guest speakers, Mrs. Uh, Wagner and Roland. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, as Sana shared in the Zoom chat box, if you are not from the West Bank and you would like to reach out to an Education USA advisor uh, nearest to you, please uh, go to the Education USA a website, educationusa.state.gov, and you can connect uh, with the Education USA advisor in your um, city. And as a reminder, also, uh, we hope to see you uh, at, in the un virtual university fair on March 17th. We will share the station link very soon, so please uh, stay tuned. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.